Now, this session is called, um, well, it's called Workforce 2030. It's designed to examine future trends in the workforce. It is a Q&A session, and uh, those of you who've just worked out how to use your question uh, thing on your uh, phones will um, no doubt be getting ready to ask questions, because uh, like the whole session outside, we want this to be warm and interactive. Now, you may have seen uh, the treasurer on the Q&A program, the real Q&A program on Monday night, still spruiking the idea of allowing first-time buyers to dip into their superannuation funds. Um, now, if that has roused your passions, uh, try to contain them, lest they spill over into the beginning of this session, because it's about something different. Uh, however, super accumulation is clearly part of the workforce picture. It has a big bearing on the future workforce, so um, bear in mind that we will obviously be taking questions on super, but from the beginning, we probably need to consider some other things. And first, um, the trends in the workplace like youth unemployment, which without a great political furor somehow has managed to reach a national average of 20%, much higher in some regions. Um, add underemployment to that and the figure jumps to 30%. Now, on a panel rather similar to this one last week, the Victorian Premier and Conservative, former Victoria Premier, I should say, uh, and Conservative firebrand uh, Jeff Kennett uh, claimed that we are in danger of creating a lost generation. Youth unemployment, he says, was a national crisis. Uh, not so, says Joe Hockey uh, on Late Line and again on Q&A on Monday. He says Spain has a genuine national crisis with youth unemployment at 50%. Now, you might call that the crocodile Dundee response. That's not a crisis, this is a crisis. Um, that's not to say that Mr Hockey is not working on solutions to this crisis. I'm sure that he is. In fact, I know that he is. We'll no doubt hear more about that from the government uh, fairly soon, but he's unlikely to embrace uh, the solutions that business, and particularly business lobbyists, are suggesting. The abolition or scaling back of penalty rates to create a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week economy. Uh, more jobs, but at lower wages. Mr Hockey clearly is not ready for work choices mark two. One thing he is ready to advocate in response to the intergenerational report is a grey army of workers to keep the economy ticking over even as the slow moving silver tsunami rolls through our workplaces. Yes, uh, we could hold that off uh, with a tsunami of migration, but like industrial relations, that issue is rather too hot, that debate is too hot for politicians to handle. Uh, you can only think back to uh, Kevin Rudd's Big Australia comment, after which the debate and the Big Australia, in fact, shrunk very quickly. So alongside the Grey Army, we will need to recruit many more women into the workplace. Should be said, the numbers have been growing. Working age women in the workforce are growing. In 1970, it was 45%. It's now at 65%, but men are at 78%. So how are we going to deal with this? What are the obstacles? And what about the structural shifts in employment, the moves to outsourcing, contracting, and part-time work? And then there is, of course, the faster-moving tsunami of technological change. Now, Joe Hockey warned on Q&A on Monday of disruptive technologies. We've just heard a little more about that. He, in fact, bemoaned the fate of what he called his beloved taxis. That's right, beloved taxis, I wondered about that one. Ousted by Uber. Now, today, those Uber cars are still driven by people. But I can imagine the day uh, when a driverless car arrives to pick me up, to take me to the airport so that I can fly in a pilotless plane to the Gold Coast. I might arrive at this conference to find it in fact empty. Uh, everyone's watching at home on handheld devices. I do my lonely thing. Then I traipse back to my room, I order dinner on a 3D printer, and then I put on my holographic helmet and watch a 3D movie about a time long ago when people actually did things. 2055 is coming and it's not just a lifestyle choice, I can assure you. Of course, it's those unemployed 18-year-olds who are gonna have to grapple with this uncertain future. They'll be 58 by 2055. They're still 12 years off the retirement age by then. Um, they'll be the ones reading the Uncle Joe Needs You posters and signing up for the Grey Army. As for me, and I've said this before, um, I expect that by 2055 I'll be dead. Or at least sitting under a tree planted very recently by the Green Army trying to remember my name. Now, any questions? 
Good. I'm sure you have. Get your fingers working while I introduce the panel and then I'll go and join them. Jed Carney is the president of the ACTU. Jan Owens is CEO of the Foundation for Young Australians. Bernard Salt is a partner at KPNG. He's in charge of their demographics group. Bill Scales is a public policy analyst. He's a former head of the Productivity Commission. He's a former Telstra director. And of course, he's the man who Malcolm Turnbull got to audit the NBN. Innes Willocks, I'm sad to say, won't be with us today. There's terrible storms in Canberra. His flight was cancelled. Our final panellist is Peter Wilson AM. He's the chairman of Australian, uh, sorry, the Australian Human Resources Institute. And he's a director of Vision Super as well. Please give them a huge round of applause while I come and join them. Ah, thank you very much. That was a short round of applause. Yeah. I had to run. <laughs> Jan Owens, are we in danger, as Kenneth says, of creating a lost generation Good morning, Tony and everybody. Yes, uh, I think we are. I don't see how we can talk about 30% youth unemployment or underemployment um, without thinking about some crisis that we're having in Australia right now. And so um, the bad news is that young people um, under the age of 25 are in a really, really difficult situation and a lot of them are underemployed. So your hipster barista at your local cafe has a couple of degrees but is not clearly using them. The only people overemployed in that regard are tattoo artists. <laughs> so I've noticed every single barista has a sleeve these days. That's right. um, but leaving that aside, this is much worse in regional Australia. And tell us what the figures are, because I know that um, we've got a, a national figure under 20, 20% yeah. unemployed. Um, over 20, it's slightly lower, but it's still vastly bigger than the national average yeah. for other workers. Yeah, so 13, 13 year high. Um, in, the, in the 15 to 19 year old age group, we've got 20%. And I want to give that in real numbers, because that's 100 60,000 young people. And then overall, um, in the 15 to 24 year old age group, 293,000 young people. Now there's only 4.3 million in the country. So they are large numbers. And of course, as we know, if you're unemployed for more than three or four or five months, it's much, much harder to get back into the workforce, even when you're young. Jed, let me bring you in on this point, and uh, can I ask you this? Do you see any viable solutions? Because the political parties don't seem to be coming up with them. Yeah, I do, and uh, I note your comments, Tony. You, you said really that the only reason Joe Hockey wouldn't take Aki's pathway, which is lowering pay, uh, is because you say it's too hard politically, but there actually is a lot of evidence to show that cutting pay does more harm to the economy uh, than good, uh, including there's evidence even to show that it doesn't necessarily create jobs. So I just wanted to cover off on that at the moment. So very clearly, I don't think a way to get young people employed is by cutting across the board people's wages. You know, just since you've raised that point, I mean, mm -hmm. the business argument is that uh, a lot of employers are put off from employing people on weekends. They'd employ many more young people if they possibly could afford to do it. Well, those instances where that has happened, and we do have some examples actually in Australia where penalty rates were lowered during the award modernisation process in South Australia, uh, the Fair Work Commission had evidence to show that it did not increase employment at all, um, even when pay dropped. Internationally, there's also a lot of evidence to show that it simply doesn't happen. What creates jobs is very basic. It is investment. It is investment in long-term things like infrastructure, that is nation building, uh, investment in infrastructure. And I've got to say, Joe Hockey and I agree on this. Um, but infrastructure, not just for its sake, infrastructure that uses local manufacturers, that uses local producers, that employs local people, and that invests in apprenticeships and traineeships that actually skills up our young people and skills up our workforce of the future. We also need to invest in regional hubs. Young people stay where their families are. They don't leave their families for lots of obvious reasons, and whether that's good or bad, we can talk about that till we're blue in the face. Well, they can't afford to go and well, read anywhere, and they certainly to. can't afford to buy anywhere. Exactly. So we need to have a really serious look at developing uh, business and infrastructure in regional hubs, I think. We need to invest in skills. Uh, this government has cut billions of dollars from our skills and training programs. I think there are lots of things we can do to stimulate the economy you stimulate the economy, you grow jobs, you grow jobs, young people get them. Bill Scales, let me bring you in. Um, former head of the Productivity Commission, what do you say about the need to change industrial relations laws, for example? Would that help 
uh, young, getting more young people into employment. Since Innes Willox is not here to argue that case, I'm wondering yes, if you were. I'm, I'm his proxy, I think, aren't I? For the, oh, poor uh, Bill. Look, I, can, can I just go back one step? I think in some ways there's a nuanced story here as well, Tony. For example, if we take the points that Jan makes, let me just give a couple of examples from some of the recent inquiries that I've been involved in. Let me give you a practical example. From Bradley Inquiry, which was the review of higher education, one interesting piece of data. The largest majority of children in the bottom 30% in SES terms <coughs> will not get a post-tertiary education in their life. Second data point from Gonski. I was also on Gonski. Many of the boys in the bottom 30% by SES will, ent will enter high school three years below standard in reading and comprehension. Mm. Uh, let me give you another data point from an inquiry which I was involved in into vulnerable children in Victoria. If you are a child born today in Victoria, by the time you are 18, you will have a one in four chance of being reported to the, that state's Child Welfare Protection Agency, mm. one in four. If you live in a particular part of Victoria called the Latrobe Valley, it's one in two. So my point here about particularly youth unemployment, it's an equity story, primarily an equity story. Because again, what we know about those people who, young people who belong to the socioeconomic, with socioeconomic backgrounds of about even 50% up, they will get an education. Mm. They will get jobs. This is an equity story. If it's an equity story, I mean, and bearing in mind you're on the Gonski panel, what do you do about it? Well, I think, I think this is the, the other element of the point that Jeb makes. Uh, I do think that, that we have to separate out employment for young people and training for young people. Now, it is true, and I think the data is very clear, if you cut wages for young people, that actually doesn't do very much. But if you actually adjust wages for training mm -hmm. and then provide training subsidies, the, what the jargon here is the marginal product of labour is low when you're just learning. I mean, I, I started off as an apprentice fitter and machinist, I know. In the first two years of my apprenticeship, I gave my employer nothing. So that employer got subsidies to train me. Um, so I think the nuanced story here is a bit different than saying, do we cut wages or don't we? It's more about how do we manage this labour market in such a way that we understand the nature of the problem and we address the nature of the problem in a way in which we know succeeds. Okay, um, a good and subtle answer. No support, no overt support anyway for the uh, business case for cutting penalty rates. No, no but let, let's again wind this back. This is a story about, the penalty rate story is a story about labour market regulation, isn't it? Mm. And what's implied often by that is the labour market regulation is never changing. In fact, it's been changing consistently. If we think about labour market regulation at the time of the, of the, 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 the great debates in the you know, early 1900s, um, that's a very different labour market set of arrangements that we have now. It's been constantly changing. And it's been constantly changing with the support, quite frankly, the main support of the unions, interestingly. I was involved in the running of the button car plan, the reform of the Australian motor vehicle industry. The greatest reformers of the button, in, during that button car plan period was the labour movement. Hmm. No whiffs or buts. But Billy, you're saying that the union movement is going to have to be more flexible when it comes to penalty rates. The union movement, movement <laughs> will understand the way the labour market is working and they will given the right sets of circumstances, will be involved in a set of labour market regulations that will meet the needs of the, the, the new emerging workforce. OK, um, I, I actually want to hear from the other panellists on this, but there is a question just coming for Jed, and I'm going to take advantage because I want to prove that we're using your questions. For Jed, how will employing young people to build roads and infrastructure, in brackets, give them the skills they require for employment in the digital age? Well, you know, when I used to take my car to get it repaired at the mechanic, they would spend ages under the hood getting greasy and dirty. Now when I take my car to the mechanic, they've got a computer. 
and they don't even hardly ever look under the bonnet. They just cooked all these things up and then on the computer is all of these technological gadget gadgets that tell you how your car's working. You know, Someone's times got to are replace changing. the stuff under the bonnet when it. That's when it right, but up. you still—that was going to be my point. You still require those basic skills and those basic uh, attributes of turning up to work every day, being able to read a work plan, being able to work in a team, being able to work with your workmates, follow instructions. I mean, the two aren't mutually exclusive, and having a job where you get the skills in a good, honest trade is still a necessary thing. Still, n nurses still need, and excuse the expression, they still need to know how to clean up vomit. <laughs> they still need to know how to keep people clean and keep them in the shower and keep them fed. You know, those skills are still there, but at the same time, they need how to, run a, need how to know and run an awful lot of technology. It's going to be a long time before Japanese robot in. drones do all that kind of work, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, so I think we're getting a really highly skilled workforce that's quite capable of both things. I'm just going to come back to Jan, and then I want to hear from our other panelists. Sorry, Jan, I just want to get your response to you know the the first, the initial thrust of the debate. Uh, you're listening to some of the solutions here. Do you have any strong solutions yourself? I I do, and I I mean far be it for me to um, ever contradict Bill Scales, and I'm not going to. Um, but I do think that the 30% we're talking about is not all SES. So you know this panel's about the future of the workforce. There is no doubt that the workforce of the future is going to be very 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 different and that's what young people are facing. So we're going into a deinstitutionalized, unstructured workforce where young people, no matter which way we look at it, are going to need to be job creators, not just job seekers. So my challenge around education and the equity issue is what are we doing to actually give young people a different set of skills and particularly around entrepreneurship in this country. There is no conversation about it and yet we're 130 36,000 jobs short just anyway. So we're going to have to get young people to create them. And I think that that is actually an issue that we can't get away from. How and, will we create an entrepreneur? And our questioners are jumping in with, with uh, good questions as well related to these issues. Almost 40% of workers are now in insecure work, casual and contract arrangements in Australia. What's the impact of this workforce change on superannuation? What can superannuations funds be doing to tackle the challenge, Peter? Uh, thank you, Tony. Well, that, is, that question is actually a symptom of what's happening. Um, work patterns uh, and durations are being broken up. Uh, the McKinsey Global Institute has estimated that half of the world's jobs in 2030, sorry, half the world's jobs today won't be there in 2030. So the structures of work are going to change uh, and the patterns by which people earn income and superannuation are going to change. What does that mean for super funds? Well, initially, we have to be much more flexible to our customer base in terms of the number of changes they're going to go through and probably the different forms of products and the mobility of those that they'll want to take over a much more uh, volatile employment life than they face to date. Does, it, does that mean, um, well, Joe, Joe Hockey... Uh... Good morning. We've got some heavy breather in the room somewhere. Uh, Joe, yes, I don't think that's Mavis's comment. Um, now, Joe Hockey um, is uh, saying that uh, we need to be flexible about the way superannuation funds work. There are different times. He, he, I'm sorry to have raised this issue so quickly. Uh, he, but uh, he, he obviously made the point about housing, but he also said later in life, people should be able to dip into their superannuation funds when needed, that those arrangements need to be more flexible. Do you see common sense in that? Well, I see some attributes of common sense in that. Mm. Um, you know, the Institute of Health and Welfare have, have produced evidence that we're living longer, 85 is the new 63, and most of us can work uh, and be normally functioning into our early to mid 70s. Do we want to work the same way that we have in that four decades of you know, high pressured life? No, absolutely. But we might want to do two or three days work, be able to draw on super, uh, have income on a part-time basis and work through quite happily as a person, mentally and physically, uh, until our, until our mid-80s. And by the time we get there, we'll be looking at life expectancy of 90. So I think uh, we get, we're seeing uh, a discrete point in the calendar called the retirement date is dead. Pardon the pun. Uh, that is going to be a movable piece where people are working less but working in some ways and wanting to draw income, part draw superannuation, or stop that, work a bit more, then come back to superannuation. And that just means there's a flexible space over the life cycle of, of all superannuants and the workforce 
which, which we as funds are going to have to cope I've got to ask the obvious question because I'm, I'm just simply curious. Is it not possible to do that now? I mean, to start drawing, pause, go back to work and then come back into There it. are some tax inhibitors on that. Right. Uh, and, uh, and I know that there's a number of issues around workers' knowledge of their super funds. My son, for example, I keep getting letters, he's in New York, but uh, he's got three or four small stranded super funds. I think people are losing sight on, on where their super funds are being uh, held and as they move quickly between jobs. So we've got to get better intelligence around the accumulation of super, where it's earned and how people are managing it. And I think that's just part of the dynamism of the digital world that, that we haven't caught up with. Let me bring in Bernard on this and your reflections. I mean, um, the demographic changes are inevitable. We can't do anything about it. Um, how, how do we best deal with it in the workplace? Well, well, there are options that we, we can um, uh, put into place. Uh, as, as it currently stands, from 2011 onwards, there are more baby boomers exiting the workforce than entering the work than generation wise entering the workforce. And that's because the first baby boomer ever invented was born in 1946. They turned 65 in 2011. So 2012, 13, 14, you get baby boomers born in 1947, 48, 49, and then you're into the meat of the baby boomer generation. Coming out of the workforce, they take their skills. Uh, out and their tax paying capacity, so you have a revenue issue. They're drawing down on the age pension, pharmaceutical benefits and all the other, and they have a sense of entitlement. I've paid tax all my working life. What do you do? Do you say to Gen X and Gen Y, would you not mind paying more tax per capita? And they say, well, actually, we'd prefer not to. Uh, baby boomers, would you mind going without all of those benefits in retirement? And they say, well, actually, no, we, we feel entitled to do that. The one lever we have uh, that I think we're, we're trying to, to push is, of course, population growth. So, and so long-term overseas migration to Australia, second half of the 20th century, about 110,000 people per year. It's currently tracking uh, 220,000 people per year. Interestingly, the intergenerational report assumed 215,000 people per year over the next 40 years, but the Australian Bureau of Statistics is actually saying it should be 240,000. So I think we'll see an even bigger Australia in the future, more workers, more tax paying capacity, and then we have to manage, of course, the, uh, the issues that flow from a bigger so, Australia. So do you think that's sort of happening without a kind of policy decision, a, a it, concrete it, policy decision? Because one could actually make a concrete policy decision to fill in or backfill for the retiring workers with migrants. Uh, well, in fact, I think that is exactly what is happening at the moment. But it's they're, not, not quite they're not telling the public that, is well, that Well, it's, it's not quite at the levels of 2009. When Kevin Rudd made his, I believe, in a big Australia statement, uh, it was around about 280,000 migrants per year, maybe even 300,000. It's wound back about 70 odd thousand or so, uh, but um, it, it could be pushed up, not quite to where it was in 2009, which seems to be a trigger point to, to, to ignite the big Australia debate. So it's a matter of finding that sweet spot where there is no political fallout, but which delivers the capacity to backfill for the baby boomers retiring. Is, is the trigger point a real trigger point or is it a psychological thing driven by no, no, talkback radio hosts and all the rest of it? I mean, is I, it genuine? No, I think it is. I think there is a genuine trigger point. If you look at, um, say, Sydney's long-term rate of growth, around about 60-odd uh, thousand people per year. 2009, it was over 100,000 people per year. So the rate of growth, rate of development, household formation, the number of cars on the road, the physical congestion, people can feel it in Western Sydney. Uh, and the same with the western and northwestern suburbs of Melbourne. So there is a point where you ratchet it up and people can actually feel it on the roads. I'm going to bring uh, Jed back into the question that uh, we started with um, uh, in this little section, which is about structural shifts in employment and the uh, rise of outsourcing, contracting and so on. Uh, less allegiance to uh, industry funds as a result, less allegiance to unions, you'd have to say. Look, I think it is a huge challenge. In some ways, it is the biggest challenge facing the workforce is uh, a precarious work and the advent of things, not only casual work, but short-term contracts, um, sham contracting in industries like construction, where we see it broadly, uh, single client um, independent contractors or single, uh, where people work for only one big 
client like Woolworths or Foxtel or whatever. Uh, these are creating really big problems for us. Um, and I think for the superannuation industry particularly, it raises big questions. People have huge gaps in their income because they have gaps in employment. Uh, people are underemployed in these areas. Uh, people never progress. They never increase their income. They get stuck in these jobs. And, uh, you know, this has serious implications for uh, retirement. What we're proposing is that, you know, I guess you have to come to some realisation that maybe we can't promise everybody a permanent job for life. Maybe those days are are gone, perhaps. But what we can do is we can try to implement government policy or social policy that fills in those troughs where there are gaps in employment. And we're looking at things like portable entitlement schemes, uh, uh, lifelong learning uh, uh, accounts, things where people, when they do have big gaps in their employment and therefore income, can actually dip into them and, and smooth out those troughs. Bernard wants to jump in here, yes, so if, I'll let him do that. If, if, if um, work is moving to more uh, transient, fluid, mobile, uncertain worlds, and I think that is certainly the case, then we may need to make sure we've got the right skills, and that, the, the STEM argument, we need the right technical skills and training. Uh, we need a culture of creativity, entrepreneurialism, so that uh, these footloose and fancy-free people in their 20s, without commitment to marriage, mortgage, children or career, can actually have a go at a start. Well, that's a, I'll, just, I'll just bring you to uh, one of our Twitter questions. How about discussing how we get young people into small business? Well, well this, I think this is creating a culture of entrepreneurialism, a culture of have a goism. And the third element here... How do you do that? Uh, well, festivals of creative thinking, perhaps. Um, uh, not so much a Telstra Business Person of the Year, but uh, a Telstra Startup uh, of the Year. They do uh, that, actually. The I, uh, to be honest you, probably. <laughs> Telstra does do that, well, and so do uh, some of the other big uh, companies. They have uh, awards for the best startups, mm -hmm. and little teams of highly educated, uh, well, I'd call them nerds, but actually they're yeah. super smart, um, right. highly yeah. talented. They're the future. I'm the past. I, well, can I, can I get I, that. Can I add to this one too? Uh, I don't disagree with you. I'm sure that there is a great future for young people who have, as Bill said, the... Uh, the uh, advantage to do that. However, if you look at the statistics in the future workforce, the biggest, the area of growing, biggest employment, whatever it is, is health. Yep. It's a service industry. It's not an entrepreneurial industry. It's, it's uh, services, you know, it's, it's education. It is, it is the intellectual industry. These are not industries for, you know, these are where people are employed, Bernard. So, you know, it, it's, it's, You've got it to walk and chew gum, though, Jen. I think that's the thing. You've, think, got to do, yeah. you've got to do all these things, don't you? Oh, no, I'm saying things. absolutely, but you can't put all your eggs in one basket. Jan wants to jump in. I, well, I think that you're both right. So some of the best disruption in education and in health that we're seeing in the country right now is by under 30-year-olds who are actually disrupting, using entrepreneurship and innovation, new programs for STEM and maths. Um, I, you know, I genuinely think that young people have got a heap of disruptive ideas. By the way, they've got the technology and the techno technological skill sets to do that. We need to create a much more supportive environment, though. And it's not just about Telstra running a competition, which is fantastic, but unless we, in schools right now, start to bring young people along a journey of enterprise. So we ran a program last year in 20 schools, just a pilot in Victoria called $20 Boss. And what young people had to do was get $20 and in a month they actually turned that into an enterprise, paid the money back and gave any profits to charity or back to their school. Did they unionise their workforce? They didn't, but 47% of them, Tony, of these year eights and nines said after that experience that they were more likely or more interested in small business and they had never thought of it before. And this was across demographics to Bill's point. There's this low SES and then higher, you know, more middle class schools. So we have to put structurally in place in education some of these opportunities. It's not random. It can't be random. Um, we've got a much bigger job to do to get young people ready. I, I think we have to be very careful too. Look, and I'm not disagreeing. I'm all for enterprise, don't get me wrong. But we do know statistically that half of all startups fail and that women particularly who go into single startup micro businesses do not pay themselves an adequate wage they do not pay themselves superannuation we know that and ultimately a lot of them fail with more debt than they began with so we've just got to be very careful with pushing all our young people into this area. They have to be, it has to be right. It has to be done very well. Right, here's a question for Bill. Shouldn't there be a greater focus to commercialise innovation and research 
as there is from many governments elsewhere. Critical point there being governments. Yeah, uh, can I just make a slight intervention in this debate? Of course you can. Debate? Yes, yes no, I wanted debate. you to anyways, um, go ahead. The, uh, education is a key part of this whole story. And there's a danger that what we do is we pick bits of the education system or we pick a program here or a program there and say, look, this works, therefore we should do it right across the board. The reality is the education system needs to address some of the sorts of issues we've been talking about before. And then we need to understand, in fact, that the education system, particularly the tertiary education system for most people today, is not linear. Uh, for most uh, people who are involved in education, it's a gap year, work, university or vet, a uh, bit of work, mm. back to university, do some more work, you know, these well, You may have to be things. doing this in your 50s in order to keep pace uh, yeah, with possible, the technological change. Like, like, like we do, I guess. Mm. Uh, but but it's, uh, it, it's a much more uh, 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 non-lateral world that we're living in, in all of these areas, including education. And the danger is that we don't actually think enough about how these systems can actually operate in this non-linear world. So let me get back then to that, this, this particular question. What, again, if we, if we think about this more broadly, we actually have to think about it in the context of the, of the structure of the Australian economy. The structure of the Australian economy doesn't lend itself to the sorts of things that are implicit in this question. Many of the large businesses that operate in this country are foreign owned. Nothing wrong with that, but most of the research and development is not done here. It will never be done here. Uh, and so what we actually have, in a sense, when we think about commercialisation, innovation and re research and development, is a misunderstanding of the way by which our economy is actually now structured. Now, that's not to say there isn't innovation, because there is. And you go to a mining company and you see enormous innovations. You know, you, you go to a university and you see enormous innovations. But it's not the sort that's implicit in that sort of question, where you've got laboratories everywhere, you've got people, you know, uh, finding uh, uh, new inventions like, you know, uh, Apple products. It's not like that. So again, we well, is, have, have to, to be fair. I mean, in the CSIRO, it is a little bit like that. I mean, they, they've come up with some tremendously innovative uh, inventions, and um, they've never been commercialised. Yes, but that's the point. Someone else does it. But, that, but that's the structural point. Mm. You have to ask yourself: if the invention was made, why wasn't it? it was, why wasn't it applied in this country? But that's what our universities are now doing. They're seeing themselves as commercial ventures. So some when research, well, some are. Some yeah. it's true. Not some all of them. Not, not, not um, all. And in fact, probably the the. the the, the greater majority aren't, mm. to be frank about that. Mm. And the ones that are, they want deregulation, is that right? That's right, that's right. That's another, that's another interesting story. It is, we won't go there. Peter? I think part of the, the solution to much we've talked about is in education. Uh, I agree with Bill, you know, at a policy level, we need to lift standards from primary to secondary so we know what's coming through in the cohorts. But smart work is winning the battle of restructuring the economy, and that's just a worldwide trend. So we have to get smarter at what we do and how we do it. And that even goes to things like penalty rates. I don't know what the value of labour is at a premium time uh, will mean in a year or two's time compared to the historic penalty rates that were struck in 1983. It probably won't be the same. So we have to be flexible in terms of how we allow employment structures for smart work to form and how we pay people. How do, how do you uh, get smarter um, when there is, as Gonski um, review proved, tremendous inequity in the very training institutions that are at the basis of this. But that becomes the focus of policy, doesn't it? Mm. I mean, you set, well, you set standards for what's a reasonable minimum in, in, at each level and moving through, and then you have a, a thermal map where you go in to the hotspots which aren't performing. That, that's what should be happening. But that's not what's happening, is it? No, I know it's not what's happening, but it's what should be happening. I yeah. don't think it's that hard. It's got caught up in a nasty political battle but the evidence of where you'd want to go and try and reform things, and we should allow Bill to come uh, Yeah, well, actually, just, I'll, I'll bring Bill back in, and I want to hear from Jed on this, and Bernard's a great question for him. Keep that up, please. Um, but, yeah, so why is it that you get these philosophical objections um, to, to a, a series of ideas put forward by people who've come from the Productivity Commission and high levels of business and so on? Um, how does that happen? Well, if you take the particular one that we've just focused mm. on, uh, this is not radical. Hmm. When you think about how we should fund education, to, to argue, as we did, that it ought to be funded on need, 
Mm. Doesn't seem to be particularly radical. But why is it considered radical well, by um, certain sections of uh, well, the political class? Well, well, it's not only the political class, it's, it's the equivalent to the political action committees that we see in the United States. I saw them operating firsthand during Gonski. The moment, and, and uh, this is to, to great deference for everybody in this room who has their children at private schools, but I saw the private schools lobby group operate so effectively, so efficiently, to make sure that there wasn't one dollar taken from them, and yet that's not the area of need. Let me give you, a, again, a practical example. Carry around in your head numbers, to educate a child in a primary school, on average, costs you about $9,000 per child. To educate a child in a secondary school to an international standard of education, $12,500. Most uh, private or independent schools charge much more than that. And yet the way by which those lobby groups were able to influence the debate so that it wasn't any longer focused on equity but was focused on the extent to which any one dollar was removed from, their, from them was, for me, very difficult to understand. And well, you actually sound quite angry about it. I'm, I'm very angry about it. Mm. Uh, because, because what it actually meant was that what we were saying was if you come from a kid from a low socioeconomic background, there ought to be funds made available by us, the community, to support the disadvantage that that brings. If you come from a family where English is not your first language, I know the effect of that. It means that you're two or three years behind everybody else. If you come from a family, uh, if you have a disability, it's serious, it's serious. And yet the, the, the debate uh, uh, wasn't allowed to continue in such a way or would have addressed those fundamental questions with their education system. Jan's nodding, I'm sure you want to say something, keep it brief. Uh, no, I'm just, I mean, I'm supporting that 100%, but I think that the equity issue is, again, a broad issue around where is it that we need to be pointing our efforts. So if the effort, if we had an idea about Australia in the future, and this, by the way, is what's missing for young people. In fact, the biggest state they have in Australia right now is super. They've got three or four accounts, and that really needs to be cleaned up. They're paying multiple fees. Um, but that is the stake they've got. Right now, the stake they've got in Australia is in their super. They can't get into housing. They can't, they're carrying a debt from university or higher ed for many, many, many years. So this is where are we going to invest? What's the plan for investment? And this comes back to what happens in school, because unless we give young people good information, and their parents, by the way, who are flailing around saying, I don't know what to tell my child to do or to study, and unless we give good information, then we're actually not going to go further. Uh, Jed, I'll just bring you in here, and then I'll come to Bernard. But um, this is a, a fundamental problem with our, uh, the way we've set up our country, isn't it? I mean, um, if you come out and uh, make the case that, oh, you know, Gonski's the way to go, and this is the key problem, um, some parts of politics are going to say, oh, that's the union movement backing the Labor Party. It's all part of an ideological push to do this, that, or the other. Um, how do you actually break that nexus? Mm. Well, I think Gonski was a perfect example, really, of how we got to a good place. And I have to congratulate the Gonski people, including Bill there, because uh, Bill's right that the powerful lobby groups were coming at both sides. I mean, I don't consider myself a lobby group. <laughs> Nobody does, do they? But uh, where they fell, I think, was very good. I think they did a fantastic job uh, with Gonski. But I think then what happens is... Well, this government, let's have a look at Gonski again. This government is not so much, I think, ideologically opposed to where Gonski fell, is that they've got a revenue problem. And they had to go and find revenue from, from somewhere. So they didn't want to fund Gonski. That was one of the things that, that they thought that's they actually, isn't it, that's all, In a way, that's the biggest hole in the intergenerational report. That's it right. addresses government expenditure, but it doesn't it does address address revenue, exactly. which would change the equation. Exactly. So what we see... On the other hand, the tax white paper not connected to it may do that. Exactly. So when... That's right. So, it, you know... When, when there is a, a budget problem, you know, you, the, I think that's where ideologies and where your vested interests come into it, because people are pushing away, this government's pushing away things like welfare, like education, um, uh, like, you know, health. They're the things they're pushing away at, to the benefit, I think, of big business 
and uh, corporations. Uh, you just look at the tax debate, it just gets cut, absolutely swide swiped by ridiculous things like Gina Reinhart today saying that she should be exempt from you know, putting her books on the table because she might get kidnapped. I mean, that sort of argument, I think, just makes a whole mockery, really, of the equity uh, debate. And uh, we've got to get over that, I agree. I just want to get Bernard's thoughts on that before I come to the question that's up there for you. Um, well, I want to actually go back to this issue about uh, education and, and enterprise. I, I actually see that those are absolutely key to the workforce of the future. And I take um, Jed's point about uh, most jobs are actually in traditional type uh, industries at the moment. If, all of, if a lot of the work in 2030 hasn't even been invented yet, the skill that we actually need is not just the, the, the technical skill at a university, STEM skills, it is the soft skills in being able to adapt. One of the fastest contracting jobs on the Australian continent today is the job of secretary. We're losing 5,000 per year. And if you had the mindset, well, I'm a secretary, and uh, that job has now uh, been made redundant, and I'm going to put in an application for these jobs, and I'll wait for a secretary role to come up, then you are then irrelevant, sideswiped, sidelined by the economy. But if you had the soft skills of saying, well, I'm a secretary, but I've got all these skills, and if I introduce myself to these people over there that are expanding that division, I can fit in as an office manager. I can reinvent myself. Here are my core skills, and to that I bolt on soft skills of fluidity, adaptability, sociability, fit-in ability. That is the key skill I think we need to navigate where we are today in the workforce to where we will be in 2030. It's a recognition that, that there are traditional skills or traditional industries, but you need to stay in that industry by reinventing yourself effectively. And you're saying this is a lifetime thing, obviously. It's a lifetime thing. It's not only young people we're talking about here, it's people it's, in their 50s. It's a lifetime thing. Maybe 60s, maybe 70s. Exactly. And I think it's also, it should come from um, programs in the workplace, it should come from programs in university. I also think that you actually learn those soft skills at home. Yeah. Teenagers learn that skill. Do you fit in or do people pander around you and you wait for the situation to, to, to fit your circumstances? If you're special, if you're unique, you're waiting for other people to fit into you. No, you're not. You need to fit into other people's situation. That gives you the fluidity to adjust to the way the workforce will evolve over the next 10, 15 years. And when years. you watch uh, your young people sitting at home in a darkened room killing Nazi zombies <laughs> um, on a TV <laughs> screen, is that a soft skill? Uh, well, I, 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 yes, I suppose if they're dealing with other people, but, but I think the sociability, um, and you say, well, you know, I've lost my job, I don't feel really confident, and you're asking me to go over to that division over there and introduce myself to five people that I've never met, hmm. But if you have been taught from the age of 12 to be sociable, to fit in, to mm. be confident in who you are as an individual, yeah. it, these, are par <clears throat> these are parenting skills. Mm. But I think they can be augmented by soft skill programs in the workplace, in secondary school, in tertiary education facilities. Peter, wants to jump in? You I'll can. give you an example of, uh, of uh, the point that has just been made. About Nazi zombies or something else? No, 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 no. All, all just very kidding. healthy stuff. The shortlist for a receptionist at my institute uh, recently uh, was three people. A PhD in environmental science from the University of Tasmania and two people that described themselves as career receptionists. And the last two, one of which got the job, had thought exactly uh, as uh, we were just hearing. Uh, basically, they thought about the job in terms of relationship management, advanced skills, networking in the office, not just answering the phone, but being, being a hub in the modular system of the workplace. And I was, I'd never heard this term career receptionist before, but they had really thought about the job in the new mode of how it had to work and how they had to succeed in work. Um, uh, just, I'll just pick up, there's a, a point there, and I think it reflects on what we've just been talking about. Parents blame schools when their kids fall behind in the basics. Parents need to take more responsibility in educating their kids. That's a comment. Uh, you can reflect on it or not, Jed. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I mean, yeah, OK, fair enough. Um, but that, the, what, what, what you're talking about, about jobs disappearing, that's been happening forever. Mm, absolutely. We don't have people shoe horses. No. anymore, you know. We don't have them making cars either. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> someone is somewhere though, and unfortunately it's just not us. Mm. Um, but we don't have, my mum was a telephonist, you know, plugging things in here and there and taking calls. We don't have them anymore. So that's not a new thing 
That's always happened. Yeah. What we, what I think what we really should be talking about are the structural problems that we have in our economy right now that we can actually deal with with policy and by doing something really important. You know, with the, with government, with taxation, and with you know really good thought behind it. And that's where I think we need to be. When, when industry is dying, uh, where do productive jobs? come from? Uh, because I, I, I bear in mind what you're saying before about the health industry and the expansion of it, clearly uh, with a greying society. Um, we're going to need many more people taking care of uh, our elderly sick uh, or infirm um, folk, and that's going to be happening hopefully a lot in homes to take the burden away from hospitals. But it's not particularly productive, is it? It doesn't create a kind of productive economy. Uh, no, no, you're right. So that's why I think, and I've always argued, that we need a manufacturing sector. And, you know, Bill talked about the button plan before. Now, that was revolutionary. That was an amazing thing. There was a lot of pain in that, a lot of people told me, but a lot of good came out of that. And we did work with industry, unions worked together and government worked together. And it absolutely set us up for the future. So we've had lots of people. We've had the, the Henry, you know, the Asian Century paper. We've had people looking at this for a long time, telling us this generational crisis is coming. Here's what we can do. But we just don't seem to have anybody that's actually picking up those ideas and just jolly well doing them. I shall get a bill on that. And uh, Jan, wants to get in as well by the look of it. But Bill, um, yeah, the button car plan, let's remember. Yeah. <laughs> um, could I'm there have been a, uh, a new car plan that actually revived this sector, well, sector look, the it's worth manufacturing looking. industry, or is it worth letting it die no, because no, other people do it cheaper? it didn't have to die. Mm. It did not have to die. No, I agree. I mean, this was, the, this was the great sadness about all of the work that was done during that period. And, it, and part of the reason, there, there were a number of reasons why it, it eventually did die. But the most fundamental reason was that we didn't, we didn't convince the international car companies that they should operate in this country and they could do so efficiently under certain circumstances. And we didn't also encourage them to do what they had to do, really, because it's a volume industry and that is to sell to the rest of the world. Hmm. They basically, with one exception, decided they would sell to, to, to Australians and there was never going to be enough volume to enable those, all of those companies to do it. One of the great successes during that period of the, the whole Keating uh, button car plan period was that we did convince them that Australia was worth acting as a base to enable them to be able to sell to the rest of the world products which were unique to the rest of the world, and they did. Mm. And, uh, Why couldn't we convince... We're, let's take, we'll talk about the overseas markets as a separate issue, yeah. but uh, let's talk about the... Because um, you've just identified a workplace issue, I think. Yes. The reason they believe they couldn't um, make cars profit profitably here, yeah. presumably, is because you can make them a hell of a lot cheaper in Korea or Thailand or China or some place like that where workers get paid a pittance in that's our, correct. by our way of thinking of it. Yeah, that's correct. Well, and, and I don't think we can avoid the issue that Australia is now a high-cost country. Uh, that's number one. And secondly, we can't avoid the, f avoid the fact that our total factor productivity has declined. Mm. If we take that same period which we're talking about, we need to understand that there was a phenomenal increase in factor productivity during that Hawke-Keating period. I mean, these, are, these might sound like small numbers, but they're incredibly large because they increase our GDP in such a way that it enables us to redistribute our income on things like education and other things. But during that period, total factor productivity grew by 1.6%. Currently, it's declining by 06 hmm. Now, you know, we can debate the reasons for that, but that's a reality. And if we don't address that reality, we will be in a debate that says, how do we cut up the same size pie? Hmm. And that takes you nowhere. Well, the only vision we seem to be getting around this is, uh, well, the mining industry, we hope it comes back. At least we hope the prices come back because we're yeah. selling huge volumes at lower prices. Yeah. But the other thing is, um, the other vision uh, is that we can provide, the, we can be the food bowl for uh, Southeast mm -hmm. Asia. Yeah. Um, that's all very well, but these are going to be giant agricultural um, exactly. companies uh, run with, fact, with uh, giant machines and uh, very few workers. So, um, so where do you see the future lying somewhere in between those we, things? We, is it a whole series of little boutique industries no, or is it service industry, the future for our kids? What is it? Well, well Jed talked about it earlier. I mean, the, the, the future is being disclosed to us right before our eyes. It's about services. Hmm. 
I mean, eighty percent of the Australian economy now revolves around services. Mm. Let me give you a practical example of that. I think most people would know this, but it's worth saying again: the third largest export out of Australia is education. Mm. Um, education is a knowledge-based sector which we do remarkably well. Mm. And yet, what we're not doing well enough now, even in the policy debate, is, is, is making it equitable. Is, make, <laughs> is, is actually finding a way by which we understand that well enough and building that capability in such a way that, again, uh, you know, it becomes an important industry for this for, mm. for this nation. Now, there will be others like that, Tony, that none of us can actually predict. But yeah. when they're when they're observed, you know, we ought to get in there and do all of the things that are necessary to make them survive and prosper. Jan. Um, what is real and what is known is that our young people will have 13 to 14 different jobs in four to five different industries. That is very different to their parents. So I agree with Jed that we need to be thinking about structural um, changes and challenges, and I agree with Bernard, soft skills, we would like to rename soft skills, we'd like to call them enterprising skills, yep, I would like you. to see yep. super doing financial literacy with young people, for instance, collaboration, teamwork, innovation, creativity, um, Britain actually monetised this and discovered that last year they lost $88 billion because of a lack of soft skills in their workforce. So they've monetised it. This actually has a value. It's not a nice to have anymore. It's a transferable set of skills. And if you have a child or if you're a young person and you're going to have 13 to 14 different jobs, then you must have a set of transferable skills and enterprise skills are the ones that you must have. You just mentioned super there. How, how would super get involved? How would the industry get involved in this? Well, as I said before, really, I mean, you know, is super... Is it a bit like getting involved in domestic Violence. Well, I, I mean, Mavis was obviously an incredible pioneer. I wish I'd met her, actually. I think um, that's the kind of social innovation that Australia also can be good at, by the way. We're not, we don't just have to be good at exporting um, the, you know, the latest, greatest technology. Social innovation is really powerful and super is an incredible one. But I think that young people who've got three or four super accounts, um, I genuinely think they don't know what that means. As I said before, it's the only stake in the future of Australia that they have. They're paying multiple fees. Who is going to take on the idea of talking to young people about super? They're very, very interested in ethical investment, more so than ever before, and they're going to start asking questions. Peter, that's obviously, uh, that throws to you rather well. Yes, I know, I just think my son again. Um, well, certainly we do, we do need to put a lot of effort in here. I think, um, as we're getting to sort of wrap-up points, uh, I agree, I think Bill's hit the nail on the head. Um, if we focus our mind on two things, becoming a highly performing, productive economy, then, and we produce more economic rents, a higher total factor, we will have a greater surplus to deal with the disadvantaged groups of change, including younger people, younger unemployed people. At the moment, it is very much a zero-sum game political uh, fire shoot, and it's not looking good. So it's going to be very hard to get consensus when we don't have a focus on both things, and we've got to be focused on both. At the moment, we're, we're losing competitive edges because we're not keeping up with where the, the world's going. Yeah, Jed, um, it's, a, it's a huge issue, isn't it? And, um, I mean, super for people on uh, casual work, um, low-paid workers. Uh, there were some moves to uh, allow accounts to be set up, and they seem to be stalled again in the political process. Mm. Yes, it's interesting. The whole question of superannuation, I mean, for precarious workers, it's virtually non-existent, really. If they earn less than the threshold, they can't contribute, and a lot of them have three, four different jobs where they do earn below the threshold, and so they can't contribute. It's, it is a big problem, and uh, it's something that, another structural issue, I think, that needs to be seriously looked at and addressed. I'm not quite sure exactly what all the answers are. I think basically getting people, uh, smoothing out people's incomes, I think, is probably the best way to tackle that. Smoothing out people's incomes. Now, that's something you might expect to hear from a union movement, but not from, let's say, a conservative liberal government. Let's smooth out people's incomes. What does that mean? Possibly not. But honestly, if you did, then you wouldn't have... Then you look at the intergenerational report. It could be part of the answer to a very complex question about how we are going to support people in retirement, uh, in meaning they have a decent superannuation account. I mean, you know, even for... A, yeah, 
a government as you described it, right wing, that would seem like a very good outcome. I didn't outcome, say right wing, I, I said conservative. <laughs> conservative, sorry, conservative. <laughs> I think that would be a good outcome. I mean, just, it, it's all a conundrum to me. You look at the whole intergenerational report and what Joe Hockey said to us is, you know, the importance of superannuation is going to be vital and yet every policy they do seems to go against that. They've stopped the increase in the SG, they got rid of the low income superannuation contribution, they're not prepared to uh, address um, uh, the under superannuation of women, uh, they, they talk about the need to have science and technology and be innovative in creating new industries and yet they cut billions of dollars out of science and technology. We, you know, they want to sack, they've halved the CSIRO or whatever, you know, we have none of that. They talk about increasing women's participation in the workforce and yet we are not seeing any real positive policy solutions to actually overcoming the barriers. It's a, it's a huge issue I mentioned at the beginning and we yes. haven't even talked about it. No, um, so just very briefly mm -hmm. uh, on that, um, what would be the most important thing to increase the participation of women uh, in the workforce from your perspective? Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing comes back to that issue of precarious work. Women are overrepresented in low paid, uh, casual, precarious type of work and therefore their superannuation is seriously affected. Uh, we don't keep serious data. We do not understand really why women do not progress up the uh, the career structures. We, we can guess at that, but the government has recently watered down all the workplace gender reporting requirements that would have help, helped us with that. Uh, we need to make sure that women are not discriminated against when they go back to work, and the ACTU has some policies right now in the Fair Work Commission that we're pursuing to make sure women can come back to their substantive positions following paid parental leave, because one in two women women are discriminated against when they try to and fall back into casual work, lower paid work or lower career levels so they lose income. So these are things that we think are very practical policy areas where we can make a big difference. Bernard, as a demographer, um, do you look just broadly in a kind of gender uh, neutral way or do you have you, have you actually got statistics around uh, the participation of women? Uh, well, certainly the, the, the points that were made uh, early on, I think in your introduction, the, uh, the workforce participation by women has uh, significantly increased over the course of a generation, as indeed it should, but there is still a gap there. And um, I'm all for as much workforce participation by women, by young people, by old people, by anyone who has the capacity to pay tax. So um, if we can get more women to stay in the workforce, terrific. That's great for women, but I'm looking at the pure commercial. I want their tax. I want young people in the workforce. I want everyone to make a contribution. Uh, I think this is not about finding which group isn't taxed enough and let's hit them. I think everyone, the entire nation, needs to be galvanised to say, look, everyone needs to put their shoulder to the wheel. Well, can I, can I just get it right? He said, Sorry, from each to his, uh, from each according to their ability, to each according to their needs. It's a, it's a Marxist concept, are, but I are, think Mavis. we actually need to knit that concept. <laughs> Mavis will be applauding yeah, that one. Exactly. Karl Marx got it right, says the demographer from KPMG. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> But on the other hand, <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, um, you, you, talk, you talk about tax. I mean, did the uh, former Conservative government of John Howard get it wrong when it, it changed the tax system so much that vastly greater numbers of people stopped paying tax? The, Any the, tax? The, the, the big demographic story here, and I think it goes back to Bill's point about factor productivity in the Hawke-Keating uh, era. We have come through uh, 40 years of demographic dividend, more baby boomers coming into the workforce at 15 and hanging around in the workforce for 30 or 40 years. Didn't matter when baby boomers turned 30, 40, 50 or 60. They're still in the workforce, still producing, still paying tax and not drawing down on benefits. It matters when they turn 65. So the demographic dividend era of easy prosperity, of rising tax revenues is gone. We are now in a demographic liability era, and it'll go from 2011 to the mid-2030s. There is a new paradigm, yeah. and we all need to understand. Our mindset is still back in the good times. We need to shift the way we're thinking. Well, um, we we yeah. could talk about alternate tax revenues to pay as you earn, like negative gearing and um, you know super profits, taxation, 80% of all mining profits go offshore. We could look at a lot of other revenue raises apart from yeah. what people pay out of their incomes. Tony, yeah. one fact we're, might we're, be... Here we are, we're in a point of summing up. So get everyone can to I sum just up. Have so one you, fact. You, you can, you can use... In, 19, in 1974, there were 7.3 people in the, in the working age group for every one over 65. In 2055, there will be 2.7. Yeah, okay, that's a pretty <laughs> fundamental fact. 
Jan. Um, well, flowing on from that, um, what's great and what's been identified by the OECD and by the Reserve Bank is that Australia is one of the few countries that has a growing youth population. We'll have 50% more young people in the next 20 or 30 years than we have now, which is a positive for us. If we're going to talk about intergenerational theft, which is a, a term that's being bandied around um, kind of just globally at the moment and in Australia, um, there's no doubt that unless we think about uh, reframing a really clunky education system that is not serving our young people and not equipping them for the future. Employers tell us that they're not getting the young people that they need. Young people say they don't feel equipped and prepared. Parents um, are really at a loss about what to do. So unless we fix a clunky education system, unless we tell a story about the future of this country, touching on some of the things we've talked about here today around education and services, we haven't even touched on digital and biotech and all the incredible things we could be pointing our young people to. Um, without that story, we've got a generation of young people that will actually be lost, but not for the reasons that we're saying, not just unemployment, but because of lack of a story about where we're going as a country. I'm relentlessly optimistic and about slightly our over young time. people. <laughs> uh, Peter, you'll get uh, 30 seconds to sum Yes, up. OK. Um, thank you. I mean, I think uh, it's an honour to be a member of the AIST and uh, to be amongst trustees and members. I think we're a very effective force, and I, I think the message for me today is it's a rapidly changing world. It puts an obligation on me as a trustee to do, continue to do what we're doing, which is talk to our members about the pressures on them in the workforce and it's how it changes, what that means for how they want to manage their super. And we've got a very effective peak body, the AIST, to put those views to government and hopefully help make changes to the, uh, the landscape that we manage in for the better. OK, well, I know all about productivity because I'm going to be working at both ends of the day, which means I've got to catch an aeroplane pretty soon. So uh, we're going to wrap up now. We're over time slightly, but uh, please thank our wonderful panel for a great discussion. <laughs>